what I'd like to do is to talk around four points. Um, and so, firstly, I'm going to talk about the threats that we're facing upcoming this year. Um, secondly, the ideology which is making this issue into something where we are put under extreme cultural pressure, which was not the case a few decades ago. Um, then, the, thirdly, the issue of uh, education and how this is uh, threatening the parents' control over their own children, um, which <clears throat> is something that we used to expect to have other, p other institutions supporting parents' rights, but that is now under severe threat, which then puts children under severe threat as well. Then, fourthly, the question of action. What can we do in order to make a difference on this? And uh, so to, to start off again on the question of uh, the threat we're facing, 2023 is not the same as the previous years that we have had in this country. We've had a period where it was a long period where everything was kind of very similar and the same uh, under the apartheid regime. Then we've had a period now between 1994, when we had in 1994, we had a big change politically. Then we've had between 1994 and the present kind of a slow moving uh, change. But now in 2023, we've got the threat of another very rapid transition that would move uh, South Africa from what we could call a liberal democracy into a much more totalitarian environment unless we stop it. And that would be a transition to move from a liberal democracy into a, what I would call a woke ideological state in which uh, people would be very much compelled by law to and constrained from speaking out freely or their control of their own children and and that is why we need to very firmly resist this and why I'm so grateful to the pastors who've organized this, this talk. And I would like to encourage other pastors to duplicate this in other parts around uh, the city and around the country so that we can, uh, we can educate people to mobilize them to resist this, uh, this attempt. Now, I would illustrate this uh, with the image of a raft. Uh, where you have a whole lot of different policies and laws which are all lashed together for the same purpose that they are trying to push through one after another. Okay? And we will probably every month be facing another one. Um, so if I could have the next slide. Um, <clears throat> here are some of the things we're facing at the moment. Firstly, the hate speech and hate, hate crimes bill uh, would threaten to criminalize uh, certain forms of speaking out against homosexuality. Now, what they're proposing at the moment would have s some protection for, for example, a pastor uh, speaking in the pulpit. But that doesn't mean you're going to have the same protection if you're expressing those same views in the public arena and you're not just directly quoting the Bible. Um, then secondly, there's the proposal of uh, what they call a conversion therapy bill. Uh, which is being proposed by the opposition party, which is the Democratic Alliance, which would then ban trying to give any help to somebody who is a homosexual to uh, <clears throat> overcome the temptations or for a person who is, is considering. And so those people could then be put in jail. Already what they are attempting to do is to uh, push doctors and psychologists who are doing this out of their professions and putting complaints against them. Um, then, but that would make it law. And if you like the phone number of the politician who is proposing that, i would be happy to give it to you, and you can phone her up and try and persuade her otherwise. Then the third thing is the unified marriage bill. Now that sounds rather like an innocent idea to have a unified marriage bill, but what they are proposing is to unite uh, the law for <coughs> polygamous marriages, the law for uh, regular civil marriages, and the law for same-sex marriages into one single law. Now, the problem with this is that in terms of the technicalities of how the law works, that then potentially removes the protection from pastors who at the moment don't have to marry a homosexual. Okay? Now, they're promising me that 
they are going to still have protection for pastors. I don't believe that promise, okay? Because previously they've made promises like that, and then a few years later they take it out again. So I don't trust that, uh, and we're opposing that law very strongly. Um, then they're actually also at the same time proposing the idea that a, a woman can marry more than one husband. So they totally take away the meaning of marriage. Then the, and good gracious, can you believe it, the Department of Home Affairs publicly said at a meeting that the Constitution requires this. That is absolute nonsense. And you will repeatedly hear these people say the Constitution requires. It's not true. Nobody agreed that back in 1994. That was a deception. So be careful when any, somebody says the Constitution requires because that's a, just a classic tactic of these um, woke people. Then, um, <clears throat> the, now they are putting millions of rands from overseas, from LGBT organizations and foreign governments to try and push this agenda onto our country. It's not coming from South Africa, okay? Um, <clears throat> then there's the organs of state which have been, inverted commas, captured. And I would argue they are captured just like the Guptas are capturing state institutions in order to loot them. They are taking over these institutions uh, which include, for example, the Western Cape Children's Commissioner, which is supposed to be protecting children. Instead, the Children's Commissioner is undermining the rights of parents in schools to protect their own children and claiming to be defending LGBT rights. Then there's the Human Rights Commission, which is hauling you know, pastors and churches who are opposing homosexuality to say, oh, you're discriminating, whatever. Then there is the Commission of Gender Equality, which has... Uh, also sent me threatening letters and stuff like that, okay? Then there's the... Um, now, if we thought it's one political party, it's not. This is happening through about five or six political parties where his agenda is being pushed. So <clears throat> the Western Cape uh, Education Department has promoted an agenda policy that would, again, disrespect the rights of parents. It would potentially allow boys into girls change rooms, it would potentially allow boys to get into girls' sport, and <clears throat> obviously, you know, men have an advantage, testosterone, that is going to result in them winning those competitions. What's happened in the United States is that then the men just take away all the pro trophies because they're competing in women's sports. So, and it's also dangerous for the girls to be playing against boys who are much stronger than them. So we need to, we, it's ironic, but we've always had Christians being accused of being um, <clears throat> sort of anti-women's rights, but now we are actually the defenders of women's rights because we are defending girls against this crazy idea that boys should be allowed into girls' change rooms. Then <clears throat> uh, there's the, just to clarify what these mean, there are three different words which mustn't be confused. The one is a bill, which is a proposed law. The second is an act, which is a law which has already been made, and that you kind of get penalized if you do not obey. Then there's a policy, which is kind of a suggestion from the government, and it's very important to know the difference. And that is that you don't have to obey a policy. So when I challenged the Western Cape uh, Education Department of this, they said to me, well, parents, if they hate our policy, can throw it in the bin. Please tell your school governing bodies, do exactly that. Just throw it in the bin, ignore it. Okay, then later this uh, month, they're proposing to bring out the national policy on <coughs> uh, uh, gender ident identity in schools, which I have a leaked copy of here, if you want to see it. Um, <clears throat> but it's frightening, and it's proposing to be giving children hormone treatment and <clears throat> to you know medical assistance to change their genders um, and, and this type of crazy stuff, which has interest interestingly actually been banned in places. Some American states have moving against that and even uh, Sweden and Britain are moving against that because they've realized the damage that this has done to children. So we can strongly even, you know, the science is strong against that type of thing. Then there is the uh, policy of comprehensive sex, sex education and comprehensive means tell children everything uh, <clears throat> which totally they don't need to know. Uh, you know, to know something is wrong, you do not need to have comprehensive information to keep away from it, and in fact, that's actually really unhelpful in, in most instances. One needs to control what information goes to children. So we've got this, this raft of legislation which is threatening us, and we need to counter that. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, 
just a story, a case example. This is a Zippo page. Does everybody remember her from 2015? She was the vice chairperson person of the UCT SRC. And she made a post on social media uh, against um, same-sex marriage as sin. Um, <clears throat> she then was kind of mobbed on social media and had people shouting in her face at the SRC meeting. The SRC meeting was invaded by LGBT activists demanding her resignation kind of in a sort of a thug uh, manner. One Christian uh, friend of mine went to that meeting and he stood up for her. Uh, the pandemonium resulted and they attempted to say she'd now been removed, but, uh, you know, we put in uh, complaints to the university and the legal committee ruled this removal invalid and she remained there. But that thankfully was a wonderful testimony that everybody could hear what she was saying that same-sex marriage was a sin. Um, <clears throat> then, and this was a, a member of parliament who actually was posting threatening stuff against her that resulted in her office being raided, you know, and people taking photographs of her, the, you know, office lewd photographs, posting them on social media. So one should expect strong opposition when you do these kinds of things that ultimately my standing up for her led to a complaint against me at the uh, Gender uh, <coughs> uh, Equality Commission. So <clears throat> uh, anyway, that didn't go anywhere. Next slide, please. Um, now, just to be concerned about where this can go, um, the lady in the corner there is the former Finnish uh, Ministry of the Interior who used to be in charge of the police who suffered a, um, <clears throat> about a 14-hour interrog police interrogation for posting this verse in Romans chapter 1 saying homosexuality is a sin, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, and, you know, they were interrogating her about her theology, which is incredible that that could happen in what used to be liberal democracy. Then, next slide. Um, <clears throat> now, just in terms of how this can practically affect children in schools. I've uh, got a, picture, uh, a shot of Westerford High School. They're handing out pronoun badges where every kid would be get a badge to say whether they're male or female. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the crazy thing about this is that they then want to punish and penalize anybody who will not use this pronoun. Obviously, Christians are not going to use this pronoun. And so then that becomes a reason in order to persecute them. Uh, one of the top academics in the world is a psychologist. He's now being in danger of losing his license to practice in Canada uh, because he did what's called dead naming, refused to call a person who's trying to change their gender by their, uh, you know, their new wrong gender name. So and then we've got girls' sport and safety of bathrooms being threatened as well. Next slide. Um, now, these are things that have just happened this year in Cape Town, uh, and how it's affecting religion. Okay, that's St. George's Cathedral with a LGBT flag. There is professing Christian mayor whose profile photo says that he's for the glory of God alone, uh, standing on this uh, agenda. This is an article, Cape Opinion, in a newspaper from a political party saying it's time to challenge the Bible. The Bible's saying that, uh, <coughs> that this is wrong, but they think better. Um, now, the question is, why suddenly all of this aggression? Because, you know, homosexuality has been around for a long time, but now why is it suddenly become so aggressive? Okay, and like, next slide. And <clears throat> to look back at that, um, we need to uh, look at the question from an ideological angle, okay? Because the thing is that Marxism was a union between the ideas of the French Revolution of overturning society with economics into a class struggle. And also the combination with Hegel's ideas of, uh, you know, attention in society which results in a new order. Um, that, this dream that all of these people have had has basically failed. One by one, these Marxists have realized it hasn't produced what they were hoping for. And so they've become disillusioned and they've been looking for something else. And this guy, Herbert Marcuse, uh, who's a Marxist theorist, decided, okay, let's expand this from a class struggle into a multifaceted struggle. So it becomes then a racial struggle, it becomes a class struggle, it becomes a gender struggle, 
and it becomes a sexuality struggle, and let's do these all together. And so he created what is now commonly referred to as cultural Marxism or woke, okay? um, <clears throat> which is effectively become the adopted new form of Marxism. The old form of Marxism has gone, but this is keeping the same concept of totalitarian control, um, forcing everybody to take, uh, follow the same set of beliefs, and cancel culture. Uh, and he evolved this in the 1960s, but it is now <clears throat> become mainstream and his dream, just about all Marxists, economic Marxists, have migrated now to wokeness. Okay? So, <clears throat> the, and I think it's important to understand, we are facing in the same way that fascism weaponized race, this is now weaponizing sexuality and gender. Uh, and it is totally totalitarian. That's why we have to resist it. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> now, ideologically, the first, um, the yeah. So this is uh, these are three features: totalitarianism, the forcing on every point. Now, you you can find somebody, for example, who supports feminism, somebody else who supports homosexuality, but sometimes that person would have a slightly different belief. Some homosexuals don't agree with same-sex marriage. They have different opinions, but wokeness requires everybody to agree on every point or otherwise you are cancelled. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then, next uh, comment. Uh, the uh, If we look at this going further back, uh, postmodernism, which is the precedent of wokeness, uh, which is postmodernism was kind of sowing doubt, uh, was originally, when it was first proposed, the first papers, academic papers that were proposing this idea didn't call it postmodernism. They called it paganism. Okay? Later, they changed the word to postmodernism. But really, the reason why it is similar to postpaganism is because it has multi nodal authority. We believe in one God, they believe in many authorities. Paganism believes in many gods. So no God in their minds has final authority and you can also make things up. So pagan religions are always developing new myths, new idols and likewise we see this ideology mutating all the time with new myths uh, and we can see examples of these myths, same-sex marriage, gender changing, genders are all the same, unborn or not people, and probably in five years' time they will have another myth, which all of them are required to believe. If we see this as a, 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 an idol-making, myth-making, part of that ancient culture, uh, which is now attempting to come back again, it's fairly naked. Um, but if we go to the next slide, please. This is not new. We've, the early church fathers were fighting this culture because classical pagan culture also had this uh, acceptance of homosexuality, uh, you know, mass prostitution in the temples. Uh, they had transgenderism. And since Cyprian of Carthage was speaking up against this again, uh, Britain fell into enormous spiritual blacksiding in the 17th century. Uh, Benjamin Keach, one of the founders of the Baptist movement, was speaking up against this. Thankfully, the Lord sent spiritual revival, turned things around, and the new generation was ashamed of what had happened. They couldn't believe what had happened in their grandparents' and parents' generation after the revival had come. So we can believe God that he can change things again in the other direction. We're not just on a downward slide, so we need to trust God for to that to happen. So now onto the subject of education. If I have the next slide, please. Okay, we've got a huge threat to parents' rights. And previously, the schools were very supportive of parents' rights, as were the governments. Um, but that is now under enormous threat at the moment. So, next slide, please. Um, now, the question is, who should decide what is best for children? Okay, and <clears throat> we've got all sorts of academics who are writing books to say what they think is best for children. Uh, we have these overseas lobby groups arguing what is best for children. Uh, we argue that it, it is for parents to decide what is best for children. And there's three arguments that we can put forward which should be convincing even to unbelievers to support that. One is that pretty well every scripture in the Bible which talks about children is either giving an instruction to children to listen to their parents or telling the, children how to, or telling the parents how to bring their children up. So <clears throat> we see then that God has delegated authority to parents and then to children, not to the state and then to children, and not to lobby groups and then to children. So we need to reclaim that authority and tell the state and these lobby groups to just back off. 
Um, <clears throat> then the question of the United Nations, a universal declaration of, of human rights says that parents have a prior right to decide on what is uh, on the type of education that their children are going to receive. Okay, that is a prior right. Basically, what it's saying is, unlike any of the other rights in that, it is saying that it is a prior right. The United Nations did not grant that. People don't need to ask for that. They had that from the beginning of humanity. That is a fundamental right, which they already have. We can claim that. Then the Western Cape uh, Constitution also says that parents have a right to choose the system. Uh, uh, children shall be educated in the system of their parents' choice. So we have to grab hold of those three bases to then argue and, and, and st stop people from taking away the, this right of parents. Uh, next slide. And then... The, we have at the moment a bill in Parliament which they are making public consultation on which would propose to substantially reduce the control that parents have over their children through governing bodies in the schools and also through homeschooling. Now, the first version of the bill in 2017 was absolutely horrific and would have kind of taken that power away entirely. And there was such outrage from parents in 2017 against that bill, the government backtracked and they worked on it for three years and they came up with a new bill in which they agreed to half of what we asked them for. So they only want to take half away, half of parents' control away, not, you know, keep the other half. And so now we're going to argue this thing again and say, no, uh, this must stay under parents' control through good school governing bodies and through homeschooling rights. So those provincial hearings are likely to happen this month and later this month and next month. And we need, when it comes to the Western Cape, we need to be ready to, to speak on that. If you're interested to talk into that, you're welcome. Then the next point, uh, next slide, um, is just that one of the risks is that with this um, <clears throat> being all enthused from this seminar, uh, you're going to go and fight this thing and then you're going to burn out. Okay? And that's something which happens to most activists. So it's not sustainable to just keep fighting. You're going to get tired. Um, <clears throat> the, so we need to take a, a three-pronged approach. The one is to, to grow people who can be strong and to, take, uh, to learn and to, to strengthen other people. Then the second one is to build organizations, which is you know, lobby groups which are focused on different things, or if you have a team at your school that of the parents and you work together, um, you know, or that includes fundraising, mailing lists, um, <clears throat> you know, social media pages, whatever, uh, to build that infrastructure, networking with other pastors and denominations or whatever, and then thirdly, fighting causes. If we just fight, we will run out of energy. Um, then the, the last slide is just the question that we need to to focus on we can't fight every all fight everything uh, so we need to choose what is the thing that you want to fight about you know maybe pick one of those things that i've mentioned and what institution are you going to take a stand with and i think that if that involves your own children that usually should be priority for a considerable amount of your energy what role do you want to take you know what has god called you to do like prayer speaking or action and then trying to strengthen by joining hands with other organizations which are doing similar things so that together you have a coalition that can exert uh, strength. Now, I think with lobbying, I would compare it with a hand. Okay? Finger lobbying, if you just push with one finger, doesn't work. People generally can ignore pressure from one source. But if you lobby with a hand so that we have maybe the Baptist Union's Christian Citizenship Committee, plus your own church, plus, uh, you know, Religious Freedom South Africa, plus Christian View Network. We all exert influence on a particular institution. Then much bigger chance that they're going to listen. So, um, yeah, I would also just encourage you, if you haven't already, to leave your, your name on this, and then possibly you can stay in touch. I will send out via email, like, you know, the email addresses of the uh, politicians who are making these decisions and then in institutions and you can write in. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pained, but one of the laws recently that has come through which forces state marriage officers to marry homosexuals or get fired, it only had 18 submissions, okay? And that's on the for and against side. So people didn't think because it's abstract, 
you know, and they sort of think it's far away. But then it's painful when some individual then loses his job. So we really need to speak out as these these op opportunities arise, and then there's um, the, the opportunities for for speaking up include uh, like social media. It includes the radio, letters to the editor, um, you know, in in like denominational forums. Um, if you <coughs> you speak up there. Uh, but then the other feature that I would say is the the different role of the local church from uh, parachurch organizations because a local church needs to be focused on a on a small group of people most of the time with many issues uh, where and because of that they can, if they maintain the, their focus on one particular issue then they'll end up neglecting their own flock and they'll end up with a situation where the the church pastor is um, then distracted from prayer and the ministry of the word, which is what the book of Acts says should be his priority. So the consequence is that the, the, I don't think that the local church can take up this kind of <clears throat> lobby group role in the long term. They can have like an event maybe twice a year uh, to make awareness, but I think there's, there's value in kind of linking in with other organizations that have a, a, a more focused approach than on one issue and many people rather than a few people and many issues. So, um, yeah, so that, that, is, uh, <clears throat> that is the outline of the reasons for the urgency this year and why we need to mobilize uh, the ideology behind this, which means that we're not just dealing with you would say if there was, if we were just dealing with homosexual people, we, why would three percent of the population be a threat? The reason is because they are leveraging this politically into an ideology that unites these issues, which then are, amalgamates race, gender, uh, and whatever else. And these people have a belief that they are so right that they have a right to force that on everybody else. And I think that if they succeed with what they are proposing here and passing all this stuff, which we hope they don't, it will have the effect on doing to South Africa what mainland China has done to Hong Kong, which is to basically strip the democracy of meaningful uh, participation and just leave it with a kind of a puppet uh, <coughs> organization. So we have to resist this in every institution um, including the church, including in the schools, including the political arena. Um, but I think that if in, we, we're not limited, nobody can take on lobbying all of these things, but we, you know, through prayer we can have an impact in, in, in a lot of these different things. Okay, thanks then.